In this video, we're going to look at the steps after DNA cloning, and we're going to be looking at applications of recombinant DNA. First, let's review what is DNA cloning. When we are studying proteins, we need to start at the DNA that actually encodes that protein in order for doing studies. So we're going to have a DNA sequence of interest. And remember that this is what's going to make our protein. Then this is going to be ligated to a plasmid vector. This process is what is known as DNA cloning. The product of that is going to be the synthesis of a chimeric plasmid. Chimeric plasmids are also known as recombinant plasmids. So after DNA cloning, understand that we are going to go through the process of transformation, cell plating, and further analyses. Okay. Now let's go through these steps in a little bit more detail. Transformation refers to the introduction of your chimeric plasmid an introduction I mean we're going to place inside into an organism Specifically, transformation refers when we have bacterial cells as our organism. Competent cells refers to bacterial cells, cells that were made for transformation purposes. Now, understand that once we have this chimeric plasmid, which I'm going to highlight in gray, that is going to be generated through a ligation reaction. So in the figure that we have in this slide, I'm going to highlight that vector with the desired insert, meaning that DNA of insert, um, that DNA of interest, I'm going to highlight it in gray. So let's say that this specifically is the one that represents that chimeric plasmid. Well, when you're doing transformations, you have to do a series of control reactions to verify that all the steps in DNA cloning were correct. And as you can see, here we have four specific diagrams or figures representing those control reactions. I'm going to uh, explain them further when, once we get to the step in cell plating. Okay. So, let's assume that we already did the transformation. Cell plating, specifically, is going to be the step in which we use antibiotics for selecting bacterial cells. with the correct chimeric plasmid. Understand that only cells that have circular DNA will be growing in the antibiotic. Because one of the things that I explained previously is that these Plasmid vectors contain antibiotic resistance. So if your cells contain 
the correct chimeric plasmid, then they will be able to grow in media that has the antibiotic. So here, as you can see in the cell plating, we are only going to have the last cells that contain our vector with the desired insert, okay, are the ones that we're interested in. All the other ones, I'm just going to check my in red. All the other samples that you see here, these are five independent samples, are going to be control reactions. They are just going to check that the DNA cloning and the transformation steps were correct, that nothing went wrong. That is one of the things why it takes so long to, be, to do molecular biology and biochemical research because you always have to double check that on each step, everything is going accordingly, okay? So, for example, let me explain the controls that we have in the cell plating. The first one, which is the cells with no plasmid, because they do not have the chimeric plasmid with, which contains the antibiotic resistance. That's why they cannot grow in antibiotic media. Unligated vector and unligated insert, because it is not a circular chimeric plasmid, these are just segments, that's why they cannot grow in an antibiotic medium, okay? Vector with no insert and vector with undesired insert. And this last one is an unusual control. We typically don't do it, to be honest with you guys in the laboratory, or at least in my years of research experience, I never performed that one, are going to be control reactions for checking that the vector where you placed your DNA of interest is working properly. So understand that one of the things that happens in this process is that when bacteria have inside of them the correct circular chimeric plasmid, they're going to grow. And the way that they grow is as a circle, and this we call colonies. Once you have a colony, this means that this bacteria has a circular functional chimeric plasmid. But because as you can see, this in essence, that last part is going to be three independent plates. You need to double check that the colonies that are there, the ones that you're going to study are specific, the ones that have your chimeric plasmid. So for that, you will need to do further analyses. So these further analyses can be done in combination, but I'm just listing some of them. So as you can see, to double check that your bacteria has your chimeric plasmid, you can do a blue and white screen. Blue and white screen means that you're going to put a series of chemicals inside the bacteria. The blue ones do not contain the chimeric plasmid, the white ones will contain the chimeric plasmid. You can do a positive selection. A positive selection just means growth without the blue and white selection. You could do a restriction digestion, meaning you're going to take your bacterial cells, you're going to lyse them, some of them, and you're going to analyze the DNA by putting in restriction and the nucleases, and you're going to look at the generation of the size of the DNA of interest and the size of the plasmid vector. You can also do colony PCR in, uh, in looking at Sanger sequencing. These are going to be specific tools that I'm going to talk about later in this chapter, but understand that colony PCR specifically through the process of doing DNA replication, but 
uh, outside the cell, you can amplify your DNA of interest. In Sanger sequencing, you can look specifically at the sequence of the DNA to check that it is the correct one. So to summarize the steps of DNA cloning, transformation, cell plating, and then the further analyses to double check that you have the correct clone or desired clone, as you can see, they are summarized here on steps one through five. So to divide them into the different phases or stages that I explained previously, understand that DNA cloning is what we see in steps one and two. I'm just going to highlight these. So DNA cloning is where we isolate the plasmid DNA and the DNA containing the gene of interest, and we insert the gene into the plasmid. Remember, gene in this case is just talking about the DNA segment. As you can see, the result in DNA cloning is going to be a recombinant DNA meaning a plasmid that contains the gene of interest, the DNA of interest. Let me just put gene, a.k.a. DNA of interest. Then, where we go through the process of transformation, cell plating, meaning antibiotic, selection, and lastly, the further analyses that's going to be in steps three through five. As you can see in step three, we're going to be placing that plasmid into a bacterial cell, meaning transformation. Then we're going to have the cells that are cloned with the gene of interest, okay? That's going to be the ones that show up after cell plating. And then you are going to be identifying the desired clone through the further analyses. Okay, now let's assume, and I'm just going to circle, that these cells were the ones that were isolated after steps one through five. So understand that when it comes to recombinant DNA technology, there's different ways in which we can utilize it. We can use it at the level of the DNA, so you can see copies of genes. This is at DNA level. Or you could use it at the level of a protein. Let's talk about specific examples. So. Two examples that are illustrated in the following figure when it comes to copies, uh, to, sorry, to copies of DNA is that there are times that plants are designed to produce proteins that are going to be toxic for their pest. So when it comes to this, you can insert a DNA inside a plant that when the pest lands on the plant, because that protein that is toxic, it is produced, it can kill it. Another way in which at the DNA level, we can be creating effects or uses for uh, recombinant DNA is by introducing DNA into bacteria to give it a specialized function. So for example, genes can be introduced into bacteria for cleaning toxic waste. And it has been utilized to um, clear chlorines from uh, toxic waste. That's one of the applications that is known to date. So at the level of the protein, 
Understand that we can have these proteins that are molecules that we know are, for example, produced in humans, now through recombinant DNA technology, just be expressed in bacteria. It is still going to be the same protein, it's just that now we're going to have it in an organism that is going to mass produce it because working with your karyotes is hard. So one of uh, two examples that we have here is the synthesis of human growth hormones, which is it has been known to be synthesized through recombinant DNA technology, and it is used to uh, treat stunt growth in another protein that is specifically called plasmin has been made to rec through recombinant DNA technology and this protein it is known to dissolve blood cloth and is utilized as heart attack therapy. Now one of the things that sometimes people don't realize is that even proteins that are commonly used uh, for certain patients are even made through these technologies. So now I wanted to point out if human proteins can be made from bacteria and can be utilized. As you can see, in 1982, the FDA, meaning the Food and Drug Administration, approved Humulin, which is a recombinant insulin that was made specifically in the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly. And this insulin actually came from another company's Genentex uh, modified bacteria. This was the first drug that was produced through recombinant DNA technology and is among the first genetically engineered products to be available to consumers. So similar to what I have explained in the previous slides, what happens overall in this process that as you can see, we have human pancreatic cells that have their particular DNA. So through the process of cloning, the human insulin producing gene has been obtained. That was ligated through a plasmid and then a recombinant DNA that contains that human insulin produ uh, producing gene, okay, was formed. Then this recombinant DNA was put into a bacterium through the process of transformation. As you can see, once you have this transformed into the bacterial cells, we go through cell plating, and then the further analyses until we obtain the correct clone. And then once you have bacteria that have the correct chimeric plasmid, in this case, the one that has the human insulin gene, understand that they are put in a fermentation tank. In this fermentation tank, then the protein, in this case insulin, it is extracted and purified and then ready for human use.